right? Well, as Brandon mentioned, that's where he was last week. That's where I was last week at the Foursquare Connection. It's an annual conference for Foursquare uh, churches all over the U.S. and also, um, you know, many of missionaries and national leaders for the Foursquare movement uh, gather. I wanted to highlight that because uh, next year, um, the Foursquare denomination that we're a part of is gathering in Anaheim, California for 100 years of the Foursquare Church. Um, so that's when Foursquare was started 100 years ago, so it's a centennial celebration. And uh, if you are interested, mark it on your calendar. It starts on Memorial Day um, each year, and so the evening of Memorial Day, that Monday, and then it runs for four days. So as registration information comes out, if you think that's something you might want to go to, it is geared towards... Uh, pastors and ministers um, in terms of focusing on kind of refreshing and teaching around that, but it is by all means open to all within uh, the Foursquare Church who would want to just be a part and see what God's doing globally uh, with Foursquare. So if you're interested, mark it on your calendar, really a refreshing time. I know uh, we experienced just a lot of encouraging words and uh, opportunity to uh, to worship together. Hey, my name is Andy Lovelace. I'm the lead pastor here at New Horizons. Uh, if you're a guest with us, thank you for being here. Um, there's a connect card nearby you, and if you take a minute to fill that out, and then at the end of service, go out to our guest services desk. Uh, we have just a gift out there, a water bottle you can pick up on your way out, and uh, leave us your information. Just let us know a little bit more about your visit. But thanks for coming. Thanks for thanks for being here. Um, I uh, was able to, as I mentioned, just be at uh, Connection this past week and just reflecting about what it is I'd like to, we're going to, next week we're going to be starting a series over the next two months, it's about seven weeks of messages on the book of Psalms, and we're really looking forward to it. Uh, I feel like it's going to be a great time of getting into uh, scripture. So many of the Psalms were written by David, but there's others who contributed and there's so many ways that the Psalms speak to our life, uh, both instructive, but a lot of it is expressive. And that's why, you know, the Psalms, another way of just saying book of songs, there's, they're just songs, poems, um, verses that were written that speak about our worship, that speak about um, what we're going through, our personal experiences, and it really covers the spectrum. So we're so excited to go through those and learn both different genres of psalms that we can turn to. We'll have those listed out. So when you want to pray along with celebration and thanksgiving, you will know those psalms that you can turn to. When you want to know uh, about lament and grief, you can turn to those psalms and experience that as they're written by the psalmist. If you want to uh, speak out and just your frustration and anger, yes, there's psalms about anger. Um, called imprecatory psalms. And those psalms say things like, Lord, break the teeth of the liar, <laughs> right? I mean, that's an actual biblical verse. You can look that up, right? It's just this anger that just says, this is unjust, this is not right. And sometimes we feel that, don't we? Like, close their mouths, make them stop with, with the bitterness and the anger. And, and so I love it because the psalms have this whole... Uh, breadth of expression that they speak to. And there's such a good prayer and praise book for us to use as a reference point to be able to say, I can bring this before the Lord. He understands me and he can speak to me in this moment. So we'll be doing that over the next seven weeks. So look forward to that starting, starting next week. But this morning, I wanted to just bring kind of a, a single message that I've been doing a lot of my own reading uh, in the book, my personal devotional reading in the book of Acts. And this is born out of uh, just one of those, you know, things that hi was highlighted to me as I was reading through the book of Acts. And, and uh, as Seth mentioned as we opened up service, this is Pentecost Sunday. And I, I, I am one of those Pentecostal preachers who, for the most part, you know, I'm a little more subdued. <laughs> hold back a little more, hold my hands, and you know, but every once in a while, <laughs> every once in a while, there's just that celebration, that welling up, right, and I once heard a pastor say, listen, the, the mark of the Holy Spirit isn't how high you jump, jerk, or how loud you shout, <laughs> 
but it is how intensively the Spirit gets at work within you and lives out of your life and reaches others, right? So, yes, we, we love and we are so grateful for the gifts that God imparts to us, Holy Spirit empowerment and gifts that are imparted to His whole church. But, you know, the one thing that is present in every instance where it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, and this is throughout the book of Acts, Paul was going through administering the early church, their ministry, and everything, every time they came across somebody, they said, have you yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And at certain points when they had that encounter, the people would say, no, we didn't know there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We just were baptized in John's baptism, a baptism of repentance. And Paul would pray over them, and they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, many times, there was speaking in other tongues, other languages that would come with that. But every time, there was an emboldened witness. There were people who said, how can we not tell about this Jesus who is resurrected and his spirit is now within me, right? As the tongues of fire came upon them in Acts 2, Right on the heels of that, what they did was they went into the streets and they proclaimed the message that Jesus is alive. And many came to him at that point. Remember the early church, that they were gathered together and as Peter was imprisoned, right, for preaching the gospel, they were praying for his release. And when they found out Peter had been released miraculously, they gathered together and said the Holy Spirit came upon them. And what they were praying for is give us Boldness. Holy Spirit, come, give us boldness, right? How many of us today would just say, we need that Holy Spirit boldness, right? In a world that says, shh, stop talking about that stuff. <laughs> stop talking about your faith or your beliefs. Start, stop talking about your Bible and your Jesus. How many of us recognize that we need that Holy Spirit empowerment that would just say, we can't stop talking about him. He is our life. He is, he is everything within us. And so we need that Holy Spirit power to come upon us. We need that life of the Spirit to overflow out of us to bring that to the world around us. All right. Well, that's not the message. Let's get into this morning's message. Crazy thing happened on the way to the church. Have you ever had that experience where you go to do something good? Maybe it's even just coming to church. And it seems like you run into obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. You get in the car, the battery's dead. You're, you have children, and you just, it's hurting cats. You can't get them all on the same page and out the door. And you just think, why is it always Sunday, right? Why is it when I'm trying to go and worship God? Why is it that we're trying to do something good? Have you ever had it when you attempted to serve God in some way, and it just felt like whatever it was you were doing, nothing was going right? And we, we look at that and we just think, what, what is it? Why am I facing one difficulty after another? You try to fix a special meal for your family, it ends up being a disaster, and instead your great meal turns into a quick order for pizza out, right? You want to help a neighbor out, but instead of clearing out weeds, you dig up some of their flowers. <laughs> You're welcome, I helped you clear your flower bed. Trying to get the family out the door to church, you express your worship to God, right? The infant destroys their diaper and, and then doesn't just keep it in their diaper, but gets it all over you, right? So it's a quick change, right? The whole family needs a change after that experience. So we've all had days and moments like that, and it seems like it consistently happens when we're trying to serve Jesus. We run into an obstacle. We run into a wall. You're trying to do good things, but it just seems like instead of it moving along smoothly, like you think it would, right? God, help me out. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to help your kingdom out. I'm trying to live with more of you in my life and less of this world, and yet, where are you at? How, how are you helping me in this? Why, why is it going easier? But it's in that moment we're reminded that there's spiritual forces at work that are attempting to frustrate you, to keep you from doing anything that would bring glory to God. And these are the principalities and powers at work within this world. They're wanting you to do the exact opposite of what you're, the intent of your heart is to do, which is to worship God. They're hoping you'll just give up. It's too hard. It's not going to work out today. Maybe another time. And so that frustration they're hoping, these principalities and powers, you'll just say, that's okay. 
Somebody else will do it. Another day, some, some other time I'll do it. It's amazing that these principalities and powers know exactly what buttons to push on each one of us, right? Spiritual dark forces aren't attuned to the future, but they are very aware of what's happened in the past and what's presently happening. They don't have omniscience. They don't know everything, but they do know what your tendencies are. They know the way that I tend to respond to things, what can really get after me. And so it's no surprise that when I get frustrated about things, when I'm challenged with things, they seem to be those things that really pop up, really just get to me, really know how to aggravate me, know how to frustrate me. They know what will get me triggered and derailed from keeping in step with the Spirit. Now, in these moments, we're reminded this is where we need the Holy Spirit. Because if some thing other than someone other than God is trying to work against what God is trying to work in my life, then that means that actually maybe I need to be more attuned with what God is doing in that moment and not just allowing myself to give up or to give in, give in to frustration, but to say, Lord, what is it you're doing in this moment? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Acts chapter 16, and we'll turn there in just a moment, but let's pray. Lord, we love you. We love your word. We are so thankful that you went to the Father, not because we don't want you right here with us, but because it's better for us that you went to the Father so that we can be filled and full and overflowing with Holy Spirit power and life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming to us. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you that even when we grieve you, you don't abandon us, but that you convict us so that we can become vessels through which you can work and live and move and, and operate through us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us. Now, teach us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to lead our thinking, to lead our heart, our motives, that as we go forward, that we would not be people who give up, who get derailed, but who would keep in step with you, Spirit, who walk with you in what you are leading us into. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts 16, verses 16 through 24, we're actually going to read two larger portions of Scripture because I want to go through the whole story of uh, what Paul went through when they came into this town because it's such a wonderful picture of what it looks like when a follower of Jesus doesn't get derailed from frustration. So Acts 16, 16 to 24. As we were going, this is speaking of Paul and Silas, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, <laughs> I just love it, right? It's like, Paul becoming astutely aware in the spirit. No. Paul becoming greatly annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This passage begins, as we were going to the place of prayer. <laughs> we're going to the place of prayer. God, we're going to seek your face. God, we're going to worship you. <laughs> they just wanted to go and pray. Here are Paul and Silas, along with others, headed to the place of prayer. And the slave girl keeps meeting them on the way, right? The slave girl possessed by a demon, this evil spirit, 
Not just once, but multiple times. She kept doing this for many days, it says. And Paul commands the evil spirit to come out in Jesus' name, and it does. So two things right off the bat, right? Here you've got Paul and those who are with him, Silas and those who are with him. They're on their way to prayer. Lord, we just want to pray. We want to worship. We're going to gather together. We're doing something spiritual. And on the way, they keep getting interrupted by this girl with an evil spirit. And so instead of just continuing to be annoyed, Paul says, come out of her in Jesus' name, and she does. Two really great things happen for God, right? Lord, we're going to seek you, and we just delivered this girl out of bondage and, and this enslavement to this spirit. This is the type of thing you would just think, awesome. It's just going to go wonderfully from here on out, right? Because I'm serving God, I'm doing his work, I'm seeing the captives set free, and we're going to the place of prayer. Paul commands the evil spirit to come out, it does, and as a result, they were celebrated. No. <laughs> Wouldn't that seem like, look, she's delivered, isn't that awesome, look, she's in her right mind. No, not celebrated. Instead, here's what it says happens to them. As a result, they were dragged before rulers, attacked, stripped of their clothing, humiliated, beaten with rods multiple times, thrown in prison with their feet bound in stocks. You're welcome, Lord. I'm happy to serve you. <laughs> right? I mean, how many of us would just, the wheels are falling off and we're just saying, God, where are you? Like, I'm doing kingdom work. Have you ever been in a place where you're serving God and you're just like, why is it not going easier for me? And I look at Paul and Silas and I'm just thinking, man, if anybody had cause to go, what gives, God? We're serving you. We're doing what you want. We, we're just trying to go and pray. We're, we're setting the captives free. And yet... We're brought before rulers, attacked, were stripped, beaten multiple times, and thrown in prison. It's like with the right tone. Really? Really? How many of you right now, having me just read that, you go, okay, me getting to church and being frustrated with my kids is not such a bad deal. I mean, that's my problems, it, it's, it's okay. No, I mean, it, it's right. I mean, we look at this and we just go, okay, it's not that bad. But... The feeling is real. We, we identify with that sense of like, man, it's hard sometimes when we're serving the Lord. It doesn't seem like things are going, uh, going our way. You talk about disillusionment with God. God, I did what you said. I'm going to do the right thing here. How come you're not helping? Anybody ever said those words to God? Why don't you seem to be helping more when I'm trying to serve you? What's going on here? Well, remember that Paul's the one who wrote the church, uh, wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote these words, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Paul tells the church in Ephesus, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the world, the schemes of your neighbors, the schemes of those who don't like, no, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. If you think that you're battling against this girl's owners, you're tempted to think that you're battling human traffickers, and that's all you're battling. When you believe that you're battling rulers and magistrates, you're tempted to think that you're battling ungodly government systems. That's all you're battling. When you believe that you're battling the crowds, you're tempted to think that you're waging war against a culture that opposes just what you stand for. You're tempted to look at the crowds. They're the enemy. But when you believe that your war is not with traffickers, unjust systems, and violent crowds, but instead it's against battling against principalities and powers who are using the things of this world to create division, harm, and confusion, then you understand what your battle is really about. Mm -hmm. You understand that these people and these systems and these 
ways of behaving in the world, they're being used by something much more nefarious, much darker and vicious than the people whom they're orchestrating these things through. Let me say this, that until Jesus Christ returns, human systems will be the avenue through which the kingdom of darkness delivers pain and suffering, while the kingdom comes through transformed people. Now this is a harsh reality that somehow these systems are out there, but listen, how else is the enemy going to work except through those who offer themselves up for his purposes? And church, i got to say that we we sometimes do get fixated on the systems and the people through whom which these principalities and powers are working out. And we say, they're the enemy, they're the enemy, that's the enemy, those people are the enemy. And Paul would say, oh, 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 church, you're being fooled. You are believing that people are your enemy. And when people are your enemy, how does the good news get to them? There are principalities and powers at work that are much stronger than a man or a woman or a system that's at work. And Paul would say, that's what you're fighting against. That's what you're, being, you're trying to confront. A lot of frustration with Christians because battling to take hold of positions of human power instead of breaking down spiritual strongholds through the presence of Jesus and his kingdom. Over and over in the book of Acts, we see this where the, the disciples go into these, and the apostles, they go into these communities, and there's just an uproar, right, in these communities about what's happening, and there's all kinds of divisions. Why? Because they're trying to bring King Jesus and his authority into these communities and establish relationship with him, allow people to come to know him as Savior and King. That's what their focus is on. Because they understand that if I can transform one, they can transform another. And they can transform another. And another. And when the hearts of people are transformed, there's no room for the agency of darkness to work any longer through those people and, and possibly the systems which they work with, right? Jesus isn't just re interested in redeeming a system or a method. He is interested in redeeming people like you, like me, who are transformational in our families and in our communities. So what's the answer? Well, it's, it's not a quick fix. It's not a quick fix. It is a longer process, a much longer process. In fact, it's a process that's been going on for the past couple thousand years. It is transforming the world through the kingdom of God, extending itself. Let's finish up our story with Paul and Silas because it's so good what they do. They don't get derailed. In fact, I am just, my mind is blown away with how they address this situation where it seems like their service to God has been hijacked and now they should just abandon ship and just let it go. But here's what happens. Acts 16, 25 to 40. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Do you know, a couple years ago, I guess it's been a little bit longer than that, I started trying to do this I say trying because I, I have not. But when I get sick, I'm a terrible person when I'm sick. I'm just not good to be around. By terrible, I don't mean I sin continuously. I just mean I'm no fun to be around. Like my wife, Jerry, she'll tell you, like, I just leave him in the room. And then when he rings the bell or pounds his fist on the wall, I water, I need water, or whatever it might be. You know, that's the only time she really wants to engage with me because I'm just crusty and. You know, not fun to be around when I'm sick. And I read this a few years ago, and I just thought, these guys are praising God in the midst of pain, having been beaten with rods and shackled. And it's like, how do you do that when you don't feel good? But I, I started trying to give it a shot, just like, okay, Lord, I don't want to just abandon my praise when I'm sick. Let me start practicing this so that I get comfortable praising when I'm uncomfortable. They're doing this. They're singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Again, how many of us, the shackles fall out, the doors open, how many of us would just been saying, woohoo, Holy Ghost power, we're free, let's get out. But Paul says, they're all waiting there, they stay where they're at, and the jailer comes later on, and he says, uh-oh, I failed my job, it's going to be my wife and humiliation for my family, I'm going to kill myself. Right? And Paul's like, don't do it. We're all here. <laughs> we didn't leave. We stayed tight. And so he begins to minister to this man. He and his whole family are saved. What must I do to be saved? And they believe upon the Lord. It says, but when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of prison and visited Lydia who was a believer there in the town. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. What a ending to this story, right? <laughs> to this experience where you just think, okay, on their way to church, deliverance happens, they get beaten, thrown, it's kind of like, there's your punishment. But how, I just think about myself, I'm like, I would have just been so off track at that point. God, how did I get here? God, how did you let this happen? Lord, why, did it, why is this happening? I'm just serving you. How, you know, what do you want? How do, how do I get out of here? I've been so focused on getting out of jail and what's next. But Paul and Silas are just focused on bringing glory to Jesus. Lord, asking this question, Lord, what are you going to do in this moment? Spirit, come. What do you want? This isn't wasted space. What do you want to do here in the jail? What's your purpose and plan right now? How do you know to sit tight and not flee the jail? Because you're led of the Spirit. You know what God's doing in that moment. He witnesses to the jailer, right? And then when he says, go, just get out of here, the jailer tells him, listen, they don't want you in the town anymore. And they're concerned, right? Because they beat these Roman citizens. They would like it if you just go quietly out the back door, leave the city. How, do you, how does Paul know in that moment? No. How many of us would have said, thank you, we'll pack our things and leave ASAP, right? It's like enough is enough. Paul says, no, that's not how this is going to work. <laughs> have them, the magistrates, come down and tell us themselves, and they can lead us out. Right? I mean, you don't make this stuff up. This is Holy Spirit inspired, just being drawn into what is it you want to do, God, in this moment. No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words, and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. They came and apologized to them. Sorry about the beating. <laughs> sorry we stripped your clothes off you. And sorry you're Roman citizens. Please don't report this. We'll all get in trouble about this. Right? Paul, led of the Spirit, what does he do? He now goes to Lydia and the other believers to encourage them. What happens, the rest of the community now knows where the other believers are. The magistrates have a sense of, we need to be real careful about these people. One, because of the power of God that was at work in this girl's life that they set free, 
Two, because there's now a jailer who is talking about his life in Jesus and having been baptized and the miracle that he saw of the shackles falling off. Now this community of faith has a sense of respect and awe about them as Paul comes to them, encourages them. And I just can't help but wonder a little bit if Paul just goes, hey, you guys, I don't think they're going to bother you really anymore. You're okay to go ahead and preach the gospel. You're okay to share about your life in Jesus because they know what it looks like when Jesus followers are doing what God calls them to do, right? Isn't this just such a brilliant testimony? Paul says, oh no, you think you're just going to take our things and go quietly? Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. You walk us out. He gets an apology, escorted by the government officials, visits friends, and then he says, now I'm done. Out the door. What started out as a day going to prayer gets interrupted. Gets interrupted and he's annoyed. And I gotta tell you, when I read annoyed, I'm just like, if that's me, God help me. Because if that's me, I don't get annoyed and then follow you deeper in obedience. I get annoyed and I get derailed. And I get caught up in my own things. And I get confused about who the enemy is and who the enemy isn't. I start looking at people And they're the enemy, and I don't really perceive as well what's happening behind the scenes. Lord, thank you for this testimony of this man that you used, who models for us somebody who can go through terrible circumstances in the midst of serving you, and they can say, but Lord, I know the enemy's at work here, but what are you doing here? Isn't that a great question? How many of us this morning would just say, God, I need to ask that question. Lord, help that be my question. I know I'm facing affliction. I know I'm going through a hard thing. I know that I'm being persecuted. I know that I don't feel well. But God, what are you doing in this moment? I know what the enemy wants to use this for. I know what Satan wants to do. I know what principalities and powers of this dark world wants to use it for. They want to get me off track. They want me to forget that you're even at at work and on the move in my life. But God, what do you want to do in this moment? What do you want to speak into my life in, in this circumstance? They're stripped, beaten, jailed. The results is the deliverance of a girl, the preaching before prisoners, salvation and baptism for a jailer and his family, validation before city leaders, and encouragement for other Christians. That's a good day on the way to church. (laughs) That's a good day. So let me give you a couple reasons that I think this was able to happen. One is serving God was not limited to positive experiences, but also in their suffering. And that's just what I was talking about before. How many of us would just say, God, I don't want to just see you when I can say, thank you, Jesus. Everything is just going in such a glowingly way. It's just everything is coming up roses for me. I can tell your hand of blessing is on me. Thank you, Lord. And so I see you moving. But how many of us would just say, I don't want to just look at my positive experiences, but I want to look at my suffering. I don't want to be able to say, God, can I serve you in this moment? Can I serve you in this affliction? Can I serve you in that dead battery, in that flat tire? Are you doing something in the midst of this? Next one. They did not equate their physical limitations to be spiritual limitations. They didn't see physical limitations as spiritual limitations. They're shackled, literally, in prison, having been beaten with rods, stripped of their clothing and their dignity, and they're contained in the inner prison, not just prison, inner prison, right? A lot of limitation there, a lot of physical limitations. But they didn't go, well, there's not much we can do here. They just began to worship, began to lift up their voice. Instead of just praying about God, if he'll break the shackles, they began to see Jesus in that moment, discern what is it you want to do here, Lord? How do you want to break down the walls and literally the spirit's power comes and it breaks down it says it shook the foundations all not just theirs all the chains broke off the prisoners gosh what a beautiful picture of what happens when the spirit of god descends that those who are bound up are set free doors come open but not for the goal of just personal freedom but so that the gospel can go forward and that god can set other people free right 
And so they didn't equate, they didn't look at the physical limitations, go, well, God, you can't do anything here because I'm limited, you're limited. And they said, no, whatever limitations we have, God, you don't experience those same limitations. So, God, you work, you move. We wanted to set you free to deliver and to heal and to see people come into your kingdom in this place, and that's exactly what happened. Thirdly, they looked for how they could use their experience to encourage other believers. And I love that this experience finishes up with the story that they go back to Lydia, they go back to the other believers, and they say, we want to encourage you guys, right? I mean, again, I'm I'm just talking about myself. If it's me, I'd be coming back, and I'm just going, guys, we we just had such a rough time. You wouldn't believe what happened. Hey, hey, home church, small group, can you just gather around Paul and Silas for a bit? They really had a rough day. We just Let's just put our hands on them and pray over them. I mean, there wouldn't have been anything wrong with that, but that's not what Paul and Silas had in mind. They go back and they're just like, hey, we want to encourage you guys. All this just happened, and God is with us. God is breaking chains, and he's setting people free. So take heart. Be encouraged. We're going to leave now, but we're not leaving and from a place of brokenness and, and disappointment, we're leaving from a place of empowering the Holy Spirit. Now you do the same. Go and share the gospel. They look for how they could use their experience to encourage others. Absolutely brilliant. They help the other believers out. Let me ask, are you asking, God, how can I use what I've gone through to help my brothers and sisters in Christ? Not just the big monumental stuff. God, what are you doing right now? God, how can I serve you even in the midst of my own limitations? God, what do you want to do through my circumstance? How can this be an encouragement to other followers of Jesus? How can this edify and lift up the family of God? How can I share this so it's not just about how God works through me, but it can be about how God lifts us all up together?